This is Edwin Newman inviting you to a special 90-minute edition of Meet the Press. Meet the Press, America's press conference of the air and winner of every major award in its field, is a public affairs presentation of NBC News. Today in this special hour and a half program, Meet the Press focuses on the country's number one domestic problem, civil rights. Our guests are six of the nation's top Negro leaders in their first joint live broadcast. With us today in Chicago is the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., president and one of the founders of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Dr. King, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, is a leading proponent of the principle of nonviolence. He's recognized throughout the world as the spiritual leader of the civil rights movement in the United States. Because of the march he is leading today in Chicago, Dr. King finds it necessary to leave the studio before the end of our program. For that reason, we will direct more questions to him than to our other guests in the first part of our broadcast. And in our Washington studio, Roy Wilkins, a former newspaper man and the executive director of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People since 1950. The NAACP, which he heads, is the oldest and largest civil rights organization in the country. Founded in 1909, it now claims a national membership of over 500,000. The first organization to use the picket line, it has been involved in many demonstrations and has played a major role in the fight for civil rights laws. Whitney M. Young, Jr., executive director of the National Urban League since 1961. A former dean of the Atlanta University School of Social Work, he heads one of the most important biracial service organizations. Its policy has been to lead Negroes into the American mainstream through job training programs and through housing, welfare, and education projects. Floyd B. McKissick, national director of the Congress of Racial Equality. He is a lawyer who gave up his practice early this year to become head of the 22-year-old Corps. Mr. McKissick's official biography describes him as a dynamic civil rights activist. He has played a leading role in picketing, sit-ins, and other civil rights demonstrations. His organization, CORE, claims a membership of 80,000 and is considered one of the most militant of the civil rights groups. Stokely Carmichael, chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a graduate of Howard University and the youngest of the civil rights leaders, Mr. Carmichael heads the newest and most militant of the national organizations. His use of the slogan, Black Power, during the recent Mississippi March stirred up a storm in and out of the civil rights movement and brought him to front page prominence. And James H. Meredith, who occupies a special position in the American Negro movement because of his leadership in desegregating the University of Mississippi and in the recent march through Mississippi. He is now a student at the Columbia University Law School. Reporters on our panel of questioners today are Lawrence E. Spivak, permanent panel member of Meet the Press, Carl T. Rowan of the Chicago Daily News, James J. Kilpatrick of the Richmond News Leader, Roland Evans of the Publishers Newspaper Syndicate, and Richard Valeriani of NBC News. We'll begin the questions now with Mr. Spivak. Uh, Dr. King, despite all of your marches and demonstrations and despite major civil rights laws, the civil rights crisis is getting worse rather than better, or at least it seems so. Do you think it is growing worse, and if so, why? Well, I think at points uh, it is uh, growing worse. This does not mean that we have not made significant progress. But I think the real problem today is that there is still a tragic gulf between promise and fulfillment and that the rising expectations of freedom and equality, the rising expectations of improvement have met with little results. So the problem today is that we have the laws on the books, but they have not been thoroughly implemented, and there are still pockets of resistance that are seeking to hold the civil rights movement back in our just and legal and moral aspirations for a democratic society are still being met with these forces of resistance. Mr. Wilkins, do you think the crisis is getting better or worse? I think only outwardly worse. Uh, we're having some, some manifestations of abrasive resistance. But actually, uh, progress is being made. We are going forward. And this despite the fact that 
great masses of people uh, cannot count the difference in today's living between that they had, say, a year ago or two years ago. But the forces are in motion. I agree with Dr. King that they're not moving fast enough nor on a broad enough scale. Uh, Mr. Young, for, for many years we had no civil rights laws of any importance. Uh, very little was being done by the white community for the Negro population or with the Negro population, and yet we had relative quiet. What is your explanation for the uh, riots that are taking place at the present time? Well, I think it uh, reflects this high aspiration of the Negro. I have never felt that social progress could be a painless process. I don't think that uh, the good race relations is purely the absence of conflict. In fact, we probably have less disruption in South Africa today where we have the greatest segregation and discrimination. I think what we are really facing today, and I think it's positive, and that is that the white community is now coming to find out that it takes more than the passage of laws which uh, uh, relieve their guilt, that it takes actual uh, determination to live with and to work with and to cooperate with, with Negro citizens. And it's this final confrontation that uh, people find most difficult to make. Mr. McKissick, what do you think? Do you think things are getting better or worse? I'm of the opinion that things have not progressed tremendously for the masses of the people. I would not dispute the statement that some progress has not been made, but I would say by and large the average black man in the ghetto uh, has not profited within the last uh, 10 years. I think you, the last statistics uh, showed, and I think even last week at the hearing in Washington here uh, when, at the Ribbenkopf when he made the statement, we have found that we've got more discrimination in education, more segregated school systems, uh, we find the employment rate, unemployment rate, is higher now than ever before. Uh, I think we could just go down the line and we could find that the situation has not improved as far as the masses are concerned, and that's what the Congress of Racial Equality is concerned with. Mr. Carmichael, from your experience, are things getting better or worse? Well, I don't know if you can make a comparison like that. I believe that what is happening is that black people across the country are becoming politically aware of their position, of their strength, and of their ability to move. And so based on that feeling, the masses of people are beginning to now move. And the question is whether or not this country is going to be able to meet their needs peacefully, or whether they will have to move to disrupt this country in order to force the country to speak to their needs. Mr. Meredith, may I hear from you on that? Do you think things are getting better or worse? Well, I think we've just reached a point in our history where we're really beginning to face the issue and the question. And the question in this country is what is the basis or what is going to be the basis of our society? Up until now, it's based on the theory of white superiority. And now this nation has to make a decision whether we will continue to uh, use this base of white supremacy or whether we will live up to our ideals of equality and equal justice before the law. Uh, Dr. King, I'd like to come back to you now. Uh, the superintendent of police of Chicago, Mr. O.W. Wilson, said the other day that your civil rights tactics have aroused hatred among Chicago white residents and are hamper hampering the Negroes' progress. What's your answer to that? Well, my answer is that this is uh, totally erroneous. Our civil rights efforts have not aroused hatred. Uh, they have revealed uh, hatred that already existed. Uh, there is no doubt about the fact that there are many latent hostilities existing within certain white groups in the North. And uh, what has happened now is that these latent hostilities have come out in the open, and I don't think you can blame the civil rights movement for that. Uh, certainly no one would blame a physician for using his instruments and his skills and uh, his know-how to reveal to a patient that he has cancer. Indeed, one would praise a, phys a physician for having the wisdom and the judgment and the power to do that. Now, we have only revealed in Chicago that there is a blatant social hate-filled cancer 
And we haven't said even that it's in its terminal state. Uh, we feel that it's uh, curable, that it can be cured. But there is no doubt about the fact that the hate is here. We didn't create it. We merely exposed it and brought it to the surface. Dr. Dr. King, I'm, I'm sure you either heard or read uh, President Johnson's speech yesterday when he warned that violence and discord would destroy Negroes' hopes for racial progress. Now, isn't it time to stop demonstrations that create violence and, and discord? Well, I absolutely disagree with that, and I hope the president didn't mean to equate nonviolent demonstrations with a riot. And I think it is time for this country to see the distinction between the two. Uh, there is a great distinction between individuals who are nonviolently engaged in pursuit of basic constitutional rights and who in the process face violence and face hatred perpetrated against them and individuals who aggressively throw Molotov cocktails and engage uh, in riots so that there can be no uh, equation of there can be no identity between riots and demonstrations. I think demonstrations must continue, uh, but I think riots must end because I think they are socially disruptive, I think they are self-defeating, and I think they can destroy uh, the many creative steps that we have made in a forward sense over the last few years. Mr. Rowan. Mr. Wilkins. Despite the fact that you gentlemen sit here together, there's the feeling around the country that there's a crisis of leadership in the civil rights movement. Do you agree that the movement toward Negro equality is jeopardized by what now seems to be a host of warring civil rights groups, each pursuing its own special interest? No, I don't, Mr. Rowan. I don't think it's quite that serious. Uh, we tend to to feel uh, that unity should be exhibited at all times, no matter uh, what kind of organizations or what kind of personalities or what kind of tactics are involved. I think we have to grow up to the idea that there will be differences of opinion and that these will manifest themselves from time to time. I don't see as yet any great split in the civil rights movement. Well, I noticed in the New York Times, Mr. Wilkins, a quotation from a so-called SNCC position paper saying, we are now aware that the NAACP has grown reactionary, is controlled by the black power structure itself, and stands as one of the main roadblocks to black freedom. I note also that an NAACP official was referring to the Urban League as an Uncle Tom organization. Now, uh, this, you don't think, is serious division or anything to be worried no, about? No, no. Uh, I call your attention, first of all, to the fact that the SNCC person said that we were, the NAACP, was controlled by the black power structure. I wondered if that was a typo. <laughs> no, it wasn't a typographical error. <laughs> and uh, it, for that, uh, we moved up on the scale because there was a time when uh, the spokesman would have said we were controlled by the white power structure. But the, the NAACP official you referred to as calling the Urban League Uncle Tom was uh, only a local official and extremely individualistic one at that, and no sense can be said to represent the sentiment of the NAACP. Well, I, I note, uh, Mr. Wilkins, that your organization lost some 15,000 members between 1964 and 1965. <laughs> Uh, you don't think the NAACP and the country are in trouble today because the NAACP put its faith in the law and court decisions, but that when the crunch came, the decisions were not enforced and the laws became just so much paper? No, I don't think we're in trouble because we lost 15,000 members out of a half million. I don't con consider that uh, serious or beyond accounting for in the normal course of events. Uh, nor do I believe that the adherence to law and order uh, is uh, a penalty that we suffered. I think uh, we all have to come back to law and order. I understand Dr. King out in Chicago as a lawyer now working on his injunction business, and I see where uh, SNCC is uh, engaging uh, lawyers up in, in uh, Philadelphia. So we all come to the courtroom and to the law eventually. We find we can't solve it with rhetoric. 
Mr. Kilpatrick. Dr. King, you have been quoted as saying that you have encountered more hatred among white opponents in Chicago than you have encountered in the Deep South. How do you account for this? Well, I think for years, uh, the hatred existed beneath the surface uh, in northern communities, and as I said earlier, it's coming out now. Uh, I think also uh, we have to see that this is something of a dislike for the unlike. Uh, and you see it a great deal among the lower income ethnic enclaves who have basic fears about Negroes. Uh, they have grown up believing in certain stereotypes, whether it's the stereotype uh, that Negroes are lazy or inherently inferior, or whether it is a myth that Negroes depreciate property values when they move in a community. There is another fear, the fear that uh, the Negro is an economic threat. Now, I think all of these things have contributed to, and in a sense have conjoined to bring about this massive outpouring uh, of hatred in Chicago and uh, I'm sure in other communities. But why should these factors carry greater weight in Chicago or in some other northern city than they would in the Deep South? Well, I'm not saying, and I haven't said they exist more than they do in the Deep South, because I must make one distinction. And that is, uh, in the South, we have had the hatred, the violence, the vitriolic and vituperative words of the mobs uh, on the one hand, but often these mobs have been aided and abetted by the law and by uh, law enforcement agents. I think the difference is here that we have the violence of the mobs, but at least the law enforcement agents are trying to preserve a degree of law uh, and order. In the South, we've had a double uh, blow. We've had the mob against us, as well as, in some instances, law enforcement agents actually and literally supporting the mob. In the North, it's uh, often the mob and uh, 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 the support, on the other hand, of the policemen trying to uh, restrain the mob. But I don't say that the hatred is worse. I think it's equal, and I think we've got to see now that the problem is a national problem and that we must work passionately and unrelentingly to remove these conditions and the kind of hatred that we see both North and South today. Let me ask about your march today, Dr. King. Uh, you have decided, as I understand it, to obey the injunction that was laid down limiting the number of demonstrators? Yes. Uh, Even though you have described that twice yesterday, I believe, as an unjust order. Yes, it's uh, uh, an injunction which I feel is unjust and uh, totally unconstitutional. But because we are engaged in negotiations now uh, with the city, with the real estate uh, agents and uh, with labor and industry and other forces of power and goodwill in the community, we decided that we would abide by this injunction uh, until we have our negotiating session next Friday and determine on the basis of that uh, whether we would continue to comply with what we consider uh, a blatantly unjust, uh, unconstitutional, and uh, I might say a moral injunction. Mr. Evans. Mr. Young, you had to contend with a new sort of militancy at your uh, national convention in Philadelphia. What exactly do the younger urban leaguers want that is new? And let me ask you also, do they feel that the urban league has become too identified today with the middle class? No, I think that that reflected uh, more an impatience with the pace. Uh, Urban League staff people are probably in the best position of any to recognize how slowly the gap is closing, if at all, in economics and education and housing and health and welfare. And I think it recognizes also that we can do all we want to in terms of getting uh, parents motivated into getting their children into school and keeping them there. But unless there are school boards that are so politically structured and politically sensitive enough to provide the resources, then our efforts to provide the motivation is of no value. 
And what they're really saying is that we need these other activities. We need the other organizations who are doing the political activity. The urban niggas know that we are not uh, middle class uh, in the sense of our services. Last year, for example, uh, over 50,000 Negroes were placed through the Urban League, and these were poor people who were placed, unemployed people. But doesn't it, uh, didn't it shock you when uh, at your convention uh, you were picketed by uh, uh, another organization? No, I think, uh, as Mr. Wilkins said, this was an act of an individual didn't and not the act of, of an organization. Even there, the uh, executive committee of the Philadelphia NAACP totally discredited this and uh, disowned it. And the individual himself apologized. He'd made a mistake. But surely Cecil Moore represents the NAACP in Philadelphia. And surely this represented a dissatisfaction no, this with the work that the Urban League is doing in Philadelphia. Is that not a fair statement? No, it's not a fair statement. Uh, this was a personal thing. And the local board uh, disowned the activity. Cecil Moore himself uh, later apologized. I, I think what we are witnessing here, and I think it's a healthy thing, is that we do have in the Urban League uh, at the moment in time when there's great turmoil and when there's a great gulf, that we do have healthy dissent, we do have impatience, we do have people who want to push faster. But I think what we finally ended up with was saying, the Urban League cannot do all of these things, that it's good to have other organizations who are supposed to do some things, and that what we need to do is to go back home and do all we can to help uh, the other civil rights groups to do the job they're supposed to do, so, so that the Urban League can do what it's supposed to do and do it better. Mr. Valeriani, Dr. King, to follow up Mr. Spivak's question, recent polls suggest that in terms of national reaction, demonstrations are now counterproductive. Uh, by continuing in them, don't you run the risk of doing more harm than good? Again, I contend that we are not doing more harm than good in demonstrations because I think demonstrations serve the purpose of bringing the issues out in the open. I have never felt that demonstrations could actually solve the problem. They call attention to the problem. They dramatize the existence of certain social ills that could very easily be ignored if you did not have demonstrations. And uh, I think the initial reaction to demonstrations is always negative. When we had them in the South initially, uh, there was a negative outpouring of disagreement. Uh, now that they have started on a massive scale in the North, it is only natural uh, that we will have this reaction. But in spite of the reaction, the demonstrations in Chicago, for instance, have not only brought the issues out, but they have brought us to the conference table. And I don't believe that we would be in Chicago where we are today without demonstrations. And let me say, secondly, that it is very important to see the difference between nonviolent demonstrations and riots. It may be true that in a demonstration, people react with violence toward nonviolent demonstrators, but you don't blame the demonstrators. This would be like blaming the robbed man because his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery. Ultimately, society must condemn the robber and not the robbed. It must protect the robbed. And this is where we are in these demonstrations. And I'm still convinced that there is nothing more powerful to dramatize a social evil than the tramp tramp of marching feet. In regard to your uh, present movement, in regard to housing, is it not conceivable to you that a majority of white Americans does not want a Negro for a neighbor? And if that's so, as it was demonstrated in a vote in California, should the majority preference be respected? Uh, it's quite true that uh, there are many people who are against open housing and who are against having Negroes as their neighbor. This does not mean that we don't go all out to end housing discrimination. It may be true that in the South, many white people did not want Negroes to eat at lunch counters, did not want Negroes to uh, have uh, access to motels and hotels and restaurants. But this did not stop the nation from having its conscience so aroused that it brought into being a civil rights law as a result of our movement to end this. Now, I think the same thing must happen in housing. People have these fears, they have these prejudices, 
And we are only saying that through legislation and a vigorous enforcement of fair housing bills, we will be able to change certain conditions. It doesn't mean that we will change the hearts of people, but we will change through laws the habits of people. And once the habits are changed, pretty soon people adjust to them, just as in the South, they've adjusted to integrated public accommodations. I think in the North and all over the country, people will adjust to living next door to a Negro once they know that it has to be done, once realtors stop all of the blockbusting and the, and, uh, the panic peddling and all of that. When the law makes it clear and it's vigorously enforced, we will see that people will not only adjust, but they will finally come to the point that even their attitudes will change. Mr. Spivak. Mr. McKissick, you've been quoted as saying, and these are the words, the civil rights movement in 1966 has reached the moment of truth, and Negro leaders are not telling it to us like it is. Now, the, most of the Negro leaders are here today. Will you tell us how you see the moment of truth that we're not being told? I don't know whether I'm being quoted accurately, but in substance, that's what I said, and I'll certainly, I'll certainly explain it. <clears throat> First of all, I believe that the moment of truth is here for the simple reason that, one, nonviolence is something of the past. I don't believe nonviolence can be taught the way nonviolence could be taught years ago. At our recent convention in Baltimore, uh, the question of self-defense came up. And the convention went on record favoring self-defense, not abolishing nonviolence, but certainly favoring self-defense. And their attitude was that, uh, one, uh, we are an organization fighting for constitutional rights. And in fighting for constitutional rights, one of those rights is the right to defend the home and the person. And then no longer could we advocate uh, that a person give up the right to self-defense. I think, two, the climate which prevailed in 1960 or in the earlier years has changed, and I think it is difficult now to harness and uh, to, uh, have the control over demonstration at many points uh, for the simple reason that most of the black people in the communities uh, do not and will not agree uh, to be nonviolent. They will agree to participate in demonstrations, but they will not agree to be hit and to passively stand there and not return blow for blow. Well, Mr. McKissick, in your literature as late as 1965, you said nonviolence is effective. It has worked in hundreds of cases. This method attacks the practice of discrimination but respects the person who discriminates. Do you still stand by that, or have you changed your definition of nonviolence? Everybody believes in self-defense. Oh, no. Let me get one point very clear. If we make a mistake, we're going to be the first to say an error has been made. Now, we are saying right today, we have had core rules for action for a number of years in which we advocated a policy of nonviolence. And we still advocate nonviolence in a demonstration. We say that we can march down the street. If nobody hits us, okay, you got nonviolence. But if somebody hits us, well, then you better have an ambulance on the side to pick up whoever hit somebody. Well, am I to understand, then, that you and Dr. Martin Luther King really are not in disagreement on the principle and the philosophy of nonviolence? Well, first of all, I'd like to answer that by saying this despite the fact that, as already has been said, that Dr. King believes in one thing, Mr. Wilkins believes in another, and, and Stokely Carmichael believes in another. I'm just the talking about nonviolence. The fact of injustices are so heaped, and they weave us so closely together, that I, d I dare say that we'll ever uh, divorce ourselves uh, from each other, uh, regardless to any point which you, you haven't answered my question on nonviolence. Are you in agreement or in disagreement with Dr. King on the matter of nonviolence? Well, the answer cannot.
only a positive yes and a no answer. The Congress of Racial Equality adopts his, its position, and Dr. King adopts the position for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. As far as we're concerned, as I said before, we believe in nonviolence, providing nobody hits us. When somebody hits us, we believe in self-defense. There's a difference between self-defense and nonviolence. Well, self-defense and nonviolence are not incompatible. Mr. Rowan. Dr. King, you've heard what Mr. McKissick said. Are you in disagreement or not? Uh, I believe firmly in nonviolence. I still believe that it is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom and human dignity. I think a turn to violence on the part of the Negro at this time would be both impractical and immoral. Now, if Mr. McKissick believes in that, uh, I certainly agree with him. Now, on the question of defensive violence, I have made it clear that I don't think we need programmatic action around defensive violence. People are going to defend themselves anyway. I think that the minute you have programmatic uh, action around defensive violence and pronouncements about it, uh, the line of demarcation between defensive violence and aggressive violence becomes very thin. The minute the nomenclature of violence gets in the atmosphere, people begin to respond violently. And in their unsophisticated minds, they cannot quite make the distinction between defensive and aggressive violence. Uh, I think that we must still stand on the premise of nonviolence, and I choose to do that not only because I think it, it is morally right, but I think it is practically sound. Mr. Kilpatrick. Mr. Carmichael, in a recent speech in Cleveland, you reportedly ridiculed as Uncle Tom's those Negro spokesmen who counsel nonviolence and patience in the civil rights struggle. Did you mean thus to label such spokesmen as Dr. King and uh, Mr. Wilkins? Well, let me first say that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee will never publicly denounce any black leader in this country, so that I couldn't have possibly said that. The quote was simply a false quote. You okay. didn't say anything of that sort. Oh, I <coughs> never critically pub criticized any black leader in this country. In the same story, you were quoted by the United Press International as saying that when you talk of black power, you talk of bringing this country to its knees. Were you correctly quoted on that? The rest of it was not there. The other half of it said that when you talk about black power, you talk about bringing this country to its knees any time it messes with a black man. Any time it messes with the black man. By that, you mean violence against the Negro? By that I mean messes with a black man. You just stop it right there. Mr. Evans. Dr. King, uh, a couple of political questions. You said recently that the, quote, extravagant promises, end of quote, made a year ago in connection with the voting rights bill have now become a shattered mockery. What exactly did you mean by that, Dr. King? Well, I mean that this voting rights bill came into being to end not only discrimination in its overt expressions in voter registration, but also to remove the atmosphere for intimidation, for economic reprisals, and for the creation of fear that caused people not to vote. And one of the things we have found is that when you have federal registrars in communities, many more Negroes go out to register because they see a different atmosphere, and they are not overarched or undergirded with the fear of intimidation and economic reprisals as much as they do in dealing with some of the local registrars that they have dealt with so long. Dr. Now, the problem is that uh, after that bill came into being, very few registrars were sent uh, into the South. I mean, federal registrars, and even today, all too few have been sent and this is even true in some communities where we know that there are outright patterns of discrimination. That's what I wanted to get to next, Dr. King. Who do you blame for the failure of, as you call it, enough federal registrars to have been sent south? Is that President Johnson's responsibility? Is it the Department of Justice? Where do you lay the blame? Well, I think it's both, and I think it is uh, ultimately the responsibility of the president uh, through the attorney general 
And uh, I would say that it's not either or, it's a both and here. The president and the attorney general have the responsibility to implement and to enforce it. I know that the ultimate enforcement of the law is with the president, but certainly he follows the advice of the attorney general, so I'd say it's both and. Dr. King, why do you think the president has not moved as forcefully on voting in the South as you think he should have? What reason do you give to his uh, not having sent more registrars? Well, the uh, uh, there are probably many reasons, and uh, I must confess that I don't know all of the reasons. Uh, I think on the one hand, some are sincere feelings that if you can get volun I mean, if you can move into certain areas forcefully with federal registrars, that other areas will fall through inevitably in the realm of voluntary compliance. I believe that that is a sincere analysis, although I think it is a wrong analysis of the situation. I think, uh, on the other hand, there are certain political forces that have sought desperately to keep the administration from sending federal registrars in their areas. For instance, in southwest Georgia, we need federal registrars right now. And I'm convinced that the political leaders of Georgia in the Senate have used pressure to keep the federal government from sending federal registrars into Georgia. Mr. Valeriani. Mr. Meredith, looking back, what do you feel your march through Mississippi accomplished? Recall, I didn't march through Mississippi, I was shot the first day. And of course, all of these other gentlemen carried on the march in Mississippi. I only returned for the last two days. Now, I think the, probably the biggest accomplishment was to place in focus the problem in this country. And as again I say, the question is whether or not white supremacy and the basis of the theory of white superiority is going to be the rule in this country, or if we are in fact going to follow the rule of equality and equal justice before the law, as our ideals say. How is the uh, philosophy of white supremacy going to be changed, in your opinion? Well, it can only be changed by two ways, and one more important than the other. That is, the white in this country uh, decides that, um, uh, and I think he must make this decision for his own survival, that uh, this country will be one of equality and equal justice before the law. And of course, the Negro must develop himself, make himself whole, so that he can assert his 25 million manpower strength toward making sure that this nation becomes what it should be. Gentlemen, I must interrupt briefly here. Our thanks for being with us to Dr. King, who is leaving us now. We'll be back with Meet the Press and more questions for our other guests after station identification. See a full evening special report on organized crime, Thursday on NBC. Resuming our special hour and a half edition of Meet the Press, our guests today are six of the nation's top civil rights leaders. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, who is with us for the first part of this broadcast. Roy Wilkins, executive director of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Whitney M. Young, Jr., executive director of the National Urban League. Floyd B. McKissick, national director of the Congress of Racial Equality. Stokely Carmichael, chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and James H. Meredith, leader of the recent march through Mississippi. Questioning our guests are Lawrence E. Spivak, permanent panel member of Meet the Press, Carl T. Rowan of the Chicago Daily News, James J. Kilpatrick of the Richmond News Leader, Roland Evans, Publishers Newspaper Syndicate, and Richard Valeriani of NBC News. We'll continue the questions now with Mr. Spivak. 
Uh, Mr. Carmichael, you have said over and over again that the white press has distorted your use of the slogan, Black Power. Will you tell us here and now exactly what you mean by black power? Um, so that uh, all of us can understand your meaning without misquoting you or distorting you. I'm sorry you asked that uh, question now because two days ago, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee decided that we're not going to define the term black power anymore. Well, now, uh, granted that you won't define it, it has been, there's been a, uh, a position paper of uh, SNCC's organization published in the New York Times. And in that position paper, these words of the uh, SNCC organization are quoted. When we view the masses of white people, we view in reality 180 million races. Now, was the New York Times misquoting SNCC and its philosophy of black power? Well, in the first place, that paper was written by some people in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It was not a public paper. We don't know how the New York Times got hold of it. Uh, the paper is 75 pages long. I don't see how it's possible for them to assume that in one page of their anti-black newspaper that they could publish the thoughts of a 75-page paper. And they said, they said, not the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, that it was the basis for black power. And we didn't know that. We thought that the work we've been doing for the past six years have been the basis for black power, because that's all we have been working on in SNCC. Well, Mr. Carmichael, will you yourself answer, do you believe that there are 180 million racists in this country? I would say that the system in this country that is set up, that affects all of us, black and white, allows for white supremacy to reign in this country and that it does not allow for any white person to view a black person as his equal but rather to view him as inferior because of the system and that has nothing to do with the white person himself he or she may be a good guy or a bad guy but that the system just allows to see black people as inferior and that the few black people that are allowed to escape are seen are viewed as exceptions to the rule. Well, Mr. Carmichael, uh, you seem to be misquoted a great deal in the press of America. I'd like to try you on one more thing. Did you or did you not say that Negroes who fight in Vietnam are black mercenaries? Oh, I most, I most certainly did, yes. Will you tell us exactly what you mean by oh, that? Oh, I certainly do. A well, mercenary is a hired killer. And I think that when this country says to black youths in the ghetto, and to black youths in the rural south that their only chance for a decent living is to join the army and then they throw in all sorts of rationalizations about you can get skills and there's a chance for them to advance, et cetera, et cetera. It's saying to that black man that his only chance for a decent life is to become a hired killer because that's the sole function of an army. Well, is I that all they're saying or are they saying the same thing to him that they're saying to every American? Well, that's what they're saying to the black youth because unemployment for him is double what it is for everybody else, while he's only one-tenth, as we're always reminded most recently, of the population. Well, do you then stand by the statement you made uh, on a recent television program that there is no reason why black people should be fighting for free election in Vietnam for some other people to get free elections I when they don't have it in their own country? I most certainly think, Mr. Spivak, that when you take black people from Washington, D.C., where they don't vote, but and white people them don't to vote Vietnam. either, Mr. Well, Mr. Then white Carmichael. people should speak to that. I'm well, that's all right. I right. represent the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, an organization that works with black people, so therefore I speak from the needs of black people. Mr. It seems to me that when you talk about taking a black man from Lowndes County, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Chicago, where he doesn't have free elections, and you send him to another country, where he is to deliver free elections for somebody else. He's a black mercenary. What about you? Do you vote? Do I vote? I haven't voted. Have you the right to vote? I have the right to vote. Are you a citizen? Well, there's some question about that. Well, since you have the right, you say you have the right to vote. Since you have the right, would you yourself serve in Vietnam? No, I would not fight in Vietnam. Absolutely not. Not urge every black man in this country not to fight in Vietnam. Mr. Rowan. 
Mr. Meredith, you've been described as a loner, as a man with no organization and no clear-cut philosophy. Now, there are some differences of viewpoint represented here. Is there any one of these groups with which you more closely associate yourself? Um, the group with which I most closely associate myself is the Negro. Now, um, this is a misnomer, this loner business, because I know that no one, including, uh, well, we take the largest group, if it's a half a million. Um, we have 25 million Negroes. Now, my position has been and probably will remain for some time. And in order for the Negro to accomplish what he deserves and needs, uh, we're going to have to find something that everyone can attach to, say, like the Democratic Party. You have uh, Senator Kennedy, you have Senator Eastland, you have Wayne Morris, all members of the same party, but men with very different views. And uh, I think that the Negro is going to have to do the same thing. We're going to have to have something that a Dr. King, a Dr. Jackson, a, 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 a Mr. Wilkins, a Stokely Carmichael, and all of the other peoples in this country, the storefronts, the hustlers, and everybody else can attach to and work toward. Do you think a declaration that Negroes fighting in Vietnam are black mercenaries <laughs> is something every Negro can attach to? Well, of course, everyone knows my position on Vietnam. Uh, and I... Um, I fully supported the war effort. Uh, I haven't supported the conduct of the, uh, uh, of the war by the administration, but uh, uh, I'm a soldier. I spent the most of my adult life in the military. And uh, I uh, personally think that one of the greatest things happening in America today uh, is the war in Vietnam. Because um, uh, for the first time, black men, Negroes, are fighting in a war. Now what this means to me is that these soldiers are not going to come back over here and accept white supremacy anymore. Now, so I think that uh, uh, if we lose in Vietnam, this nation will go down. Now, I want to be a part of a great nation, uh, and uh, I think the Negro wants to be a part of it. Consequently, uh, uh, Stokely hasn't been in the military. I don't want to argue with these fellas. I mean, they can believe anything they want. But I'm, uh, I'm a military man, and I support soldiers fighting. I think everybody should support soldiers fighting. Mr. Meredith, the crux of the issue here today is how to go about wiping out white supremacy, which you've mentioned. Now, isn't the real issue whether the Negro's objective is integration or isolation? I don't think so, because here, 99% of the Negroes are going to be isolated anyway, certainly for many years to come. Now. Um, I am now concerned, and this is what I'm devoting most of my effort to, to the Negro himself, particularly right now in voter registration efforts throughout this country. Uh, the Negro in this country feels left out. I meet them every day. They tell me, why register? Because it's going to be fixed anyway. Now, I don't blame them for feeling this, because in the past it has been fixed. And uh, they have been, if not being sold out, they have been, uh, not, they're not being represented by the people who are up there supposed to represent them. Mr. Kilpatrick. Mr. Wilkins, a few questions dealing with desegregation of the schools. Here in Washington, you are, of course, familiar with the process of resegregation that has resulted over the past 10 or 12 years. In what way would you combat this tendency toward resegregation that is brought on by the flight of white parents to the suburbs? I think Washington gave a little of that answer itself in the early days. Uh, the answer, of course, lies in the strengthening of the whole system of public education, irrespective of whether it's in the city or in the suburbs or whether they're white children or black children. Uh, I would say that uh, the sentiment of the Negro community is for integration and quality education with emphasis on the latter. I had in mind the, the specific tools that have been proposed by various persons, such as Mr. Howell, the Commissioner of Education, the use of federal funds in such a way as to coerce or um, to compel the 
more complete integration of schools in suburbs and in cities. Had you thought of that? Uh, yes, I thought of it, and I, I approve uh, what Mr. Howe has in mind, and, and I go f farther than he does. I feel that the education of the Negro minority in this country is something that has too long been neglected by the local school boards, by the cities, by the states, and that it's time that the federal government impose not only the restrictions that Mr. Howe uh, talks about, and I applaud him for what he has done, uh, but additional ones. The, in this case, uh, Mr. Kilpatrick, just as in the case of lynching, the local communities have proved themselves unable to deal effectively with the situation, and yet they say, we mustn't have federal interference. I can't buy that. I'm sorry. If I understand correctly the implications of some of the speeches Mr. Howe has been making lately, he is proposing to say to a city and its surrounding suburban county, which may be and ordinarily is under an entirely different government, neither one of your jurisdictions will receive federal aid unless your school systems are melded together uh, and the children are exchanged or bust or, or brought into more integrated situations. This is what you favor and uh, would like to see? I would like to see as, as much... First, I put quality education. Second, integration. I don't think a child in this country can have a complete education, either white, black, a white or black child, if he goes to a segregated school all his life. He's going to have to live in a multiracial community. He'll have to function as an adult in a multiracial community. And very shortly, he's going to have to function in a multiracial world. And he can't sell refrigerators in Nigeria with the kind of nomenclature that he uses in rural Georgia. Mr. Evans. Mr. McKissick, I'd like to ask you if you would try to explain for me the comment about CORE made recently by Lillian Smith, who, as you know, has just removed herself from the board of CORE and is one of its oldest and most uh, uh, valued supporters. She says, CORE has been infiltrated by adventurers and nihilists, black nationalists, and plain old-fashioned haters who have finally taken over, unquote. Why do you think Lillian Smith has been affected this way by the developments in CORE of the last six months? Um, I can't understand, uh, uh, I, I really don't understand how Ms. Smith has got such an impression. I think it's possibly because she has not uh, been attending the meetings of the organization and have not met uh, its board of directors and its chapter members. But uh, I assure you that uh, we regret the loss of uh, Miss Smith, uh, for she has made notable contributions to the organization, but I don't think that uh, uh, her interpretations or uh, the way she defines the people in core would be a correct one in any sense. Do you think, uh, Mr. McKissick, beyond Lillian Smith, that there has been an alienation between uh, white liberals and core uh, in the last few months. And if so, does this disturb you as a Negro leader? Well, we would, of course, we would uh, like to have everyone love us, if at all possible. Uh, and of course, we hate to lose uh, friends. It's no question about that, but simply because people get disturbed by a change in policy uh, it simply uh, means that uh, we'll have to move the organization alone uh, without those people uh, if those people decide not to go with us. Well, Mr. McKissick, last question. Uh, since black power is one of the basic reasons behind Lillian Smith's move and some of this other alienation I talked about, could you define very quickly for us your concept of black power? Yes, I'll be quite happy to define it. That is course, philosophy of black power. One, we have stated that black people must decide for themselves. They must have uh, the self-determination to determine the direction and the pace in which they will become total citizens in this society. And in doing so, six basic ingredients are needed. One, political power. Two, economic power. Three, an improved self-image of the black man himself. As you well know, that's not in the history books, what we've done and the contributions that we've made. Four, the development of young militant leadership. Five, the enforcement of federal laws, the abolishment of, of police brutality. And six, the development of a black consumer block. 
Mr. That's Val basically what we described as black magic. Mr. Valeriani. Now, Mr. Young, to follow up that question, don't most of the civil rights leaders go along with the concept of black power, but rather deplore the idea that the term is being used, that it has a bad psychological effect? Well, I can speak for the Urban League. Uh, we took a position, number one, that we should be uh, very cautious about trying to interpret the slogans of other organizations. Secondly, we deplored the country's obsession and preoccupation with a debate about a slogan, which we felt uh, deterred the country from concentrating on the problems of poverty and discrimination. The Urban League takes a position which, uh, uh, that power is something that one acquires through uh, having sufficient economic means, educational resources, and political know-how. Uh, we do not feel that one uh, gets pride or dignity or power simply by, by being white or being black, but by uh, mobilizing uh, into uh, various uh, groups who have similar ideas and working toward those ends. Uh, I think I must admit that any slogan, any motto uh, that is left open to so many interpretations uh, it always runs a risk. You talk about uh, developing pride, and Mr. Meredith has talked about making the Negro whole, and Mr. McKissick has also talked about pride. Yet the civil rights leadership seems extremely reluctant to face up to the implications of the Moynihan Report, which documents the disintegration of the Negro family. Why is this? Well, I think the uh, opposition, or uh, the reservations that many of us had about the Moynihan Report, were one that it was entitled The Negro Family, which tended to indict 75% uh, of the Negro families that are stable and not disorganized. I think the fact that it pointed up the social pathologies of the Negro and highlighted those and did not point up the social pathology of the white society that had caused them was unfortunate. I think also we resented the fact that uh, the, these various uh, social disorganizations such as illegitimacy and crime and some of the other things seemed rather high as far as the Negro is concerned. Uh, he did not point out that these were related to socioeconomic conditions, and that while the illegitimacy rate might be uh, much higher among Negroes, uh, say 60% of the illegitimacy happens to be Negro, uh, actually 90% of the abortion rate happens to be white, and I'm assuming that the initial activity was the same, so there's no question of, of morality. But I, I, uh, the report really presented not anything too new to, to Negroes. Uh, we had talked about it uh, uh, in, in our presentation of a Marshall Plan. Franklin Frazier had talked about it years before. It was an in-house report. I, uh, I have great respect for Mr. Monaghan. I think he's a, he's a genuine uh, liberal in this cause. But it was an in-house document. It wasn't a published, uh, expected to be a published report. But uh, since it became one, I feel free to make what I think a valid criticism. Mr. Carmichael, I think you were disturbed by something that was said by Mr. Young? Well, no, I was disturbed by the Monaghan report, never by what my fellow black brother says, at least publicly. <laughs> I was disturbed by the Monaghan report because what he was trying to do was to put the blame on the... May I just interrupt and make it clear that what we're talking about is a report drawn up by Daniel P. Monaghan when he was Assistant Secretary of Labor. Right. He put the blame on the black family. It's the same old trick of the oppressor switching the blame to the oppressed and saying to the oppressed, it's your fault why you are the way you are, without admitting that the oppressed are the ones who put the people where they were. I Mr. mean, Carmichael, may I in fairness ask you this question, it's in fairness to Mr. Monaghan, did he put the blame or was he just reporting a fact? I've talked to Mr. Monaghan and I don't believe he was placing blame, he was placing, he was simply stating some facts. No, no, he tended to place the blame. He tended to say that now if all uh, black men and black women got married and have two kids, all the problems would be over. That's what it led to. That was the conclusion and gist of the report, without stating, in fact, that in the black ghettos of this country, that black employment runs rampant, and that's not the fault of black people, that black mothers have to work as maids away from their children while everybody else has a right to be home helping to bring their children up, and that's not the fault of black mothers. Well, uh, I, I, I think I'd better cut off this discussion of the Moynihan report since Mr. Moynihan is not here to defend himself. Uh, <laughs> I, 
I think, and I know him quite well, that you, you have mistaken what he said, but still. Mr. Spivak. Uh, Mr. Meredith, in your Saturday evening uh, Post article recently, you wrote there is much feeling that Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolence is no longer tenable. Now, do you believe that, or were you simply reporting on something? Well, well, of course, course I, I believe it. it. Um, this, um, in the first place, nonviolence is incompatible with American ideas. Um, this, this is a military-minded nation. It always has been. And uh, I'm uh, very, very afraid that if 25 million people start to go a different direction from what the mainstream is going, uh, and let me say what I think that mainstream is, I think, I think this country, country is uh, one that uh, basically, basically is a tough, tough country. Uh, uh, it's frontier, frontier type, type of uh, uh, mentality. And, and everyone has, has the philosophy, you, you do right, right. But, you but you make sure, sure everyone, everyone else uh, does, does right, right as well. well. Now, my, my father never, never shot anybody. anybody. But, he but he always had, had a gun above his bed and shells would reach. reach. And I'm, and I'm sure, sure that if someone had broken his house to disturb his family, he would have shot someone. Now, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I I see great, great dangers, dangers in, in uh, nonviolence, non although uh, there, there are many uh, advantages to this country. Well, Mr. Mayor, don't, don't you think we ought to get straight on the difference between nonviolence and self-defense? I, I think when Dr. King, King may I say this just a minute, I think, I think when Dr. King and others speak about, about nonviolence, they, they say that groups, groups of Negroes should shouldn't take arms and shouldn't take, as some have advocated, the whole thing. Nonviolence is not the opposite of violence. And this, and this is where, where the whole trick is, is in this whole business of nonviolence. And I think we should clear that up. No, 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 but, but there's, there's a difference between, between self-defense. I, I don't think, think that there are many of us who don't believe in the right of self-defense and any Negro against anyone who attacks it. The opposite of violence. And, and this, this is where this country, country has been, been trying to lead the Negro down a wrong road. They've been trying to say to him, if you're not nonviolent, if, if you, you don't, don't turn out the cheek, you are violent. Well, let me ask you a specific question. May I ask you a specific question? When, when we talk about nonviolence, we're, we're saying that the Negro, Negro are not in groups, groups, groups or, or alone. Take, take up a gun, gun or do, or do anything, anything else. Neither, neither should a white man. man. In order to take what he believes belongs to him. Now, that is the difference between nonviolence. Self-defense is when somebody attacks him. Excuse me, gentlemen. Let me ask you a Because... This, this is, is not. not. The, the Negro, Negro has, has never, never in his history, his history engaged, engaged in the type of violence, violence people, people are talking about. The, the whites, whites have always engaged in this type of violence. violence. Now, now uh, what, what really, really happened, happened with nonviolence? Non they, they took the Negro, Negro as he was in 1960, or whenever it was, and they, and they attached, attached his name, nonviolence, to him. And thereby gave a legitimacy to a particular movement. And then and this uh, changed, changed nothing, nothing, it just gave a name to what, to what already existed and gave, gave the implication that if this, this was not the case, there, there would be violence. violence. And, and the Negro has, has never entertained, entertained the idea of taking, of taking up arms, arms against the whites, white. and, and they, they cannot. cannot. But, but now, uh, I, I think, think the Negro must, must become, become a part, part of this mainstream, mainstream. And, and if the whites not in take Mississippi, for instance. Now, I know the people who shot in my home years ago, they, they know, know the people who killed, killed all of the Negroes have been killed. killed. The, community the community knows them, the whites, whites know them, and the Negroes know them. And I'm, and I'm here to say that these, these people have, have to be removed from our society. White, white supremacy will, will not allow itself, allow itself to remove these, these people from its society. Now, now if they, they don't, don't find a way, way the, the Negro has, has no choice but to remove these men, men and, and they have to be removed. You can't have killers. Running, running around, around in the society, society killing people. Are you, you suggesting then that, that if several, several Negroes are killed, killed or any white, white men are killed, killed the law does not punish, punish them, as it happens very often in the case, case of white, white men too, too that the people, people ought to organize the lit vigilante and go out and, and take, take it, the law into their own hands and admit violence? You're not saying that. That's exactly what I'm saying. Exactly. And because 
Uh, uh, look, 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 I know personally the man, the man that tried, tried to kill, kill my family, family. when I was at the University, University of Mississippi. Mississippi. And, and everybody, everybody in the community knows. knows. And, and I, I know, know that in all, all the other communities, communities in Mississippi, and you've, you've read about, about all these killings, killings done them on. They, they killed this 65-year-old man, shot out him 16 times. You, you didn't pick up a gun and go out and try to kill that man because the law has to take care of him. You don't believe in that, do you? This is what we're going to have to move to. If the law doesn't take these men, then, then we, we got to stop, stop this. We, we cannot, cannot continue, continue to, 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 to tolerate, tolerate this. Now, now I don't know why. why. Mr. Mayor, uh, do you mean, mean to tell me that, me that you believe that the Negroes, Negroes of this country ought to organize, to organize take, take up guns, and, guns, and if the law doesn't, doesn't take, take care, care of, the, of, the, of the wrongs that the white, white man or other Negroes commit against them, that they ought to take the law into their own hands? This is precisely, and I'll tell you why. Because the white supremacy is the system. Well, Mr. Well, Mr. Maris says they need to make sense against, against 180 million people. If you, you do what they're going to do. Well, look, let, let, me, let, me, let me explain it. it. If you let, let me explain it, then you'll understand. You see, you see in, in Mississippi, I know it to be a fact, fact that most, most of the whites in Mississippi are good whites. They don't, they don't like this. this. They, they condone, condone it. it. They, they tell me that. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they just dislike it. They tell me this. But they're powerless to do anything about it. They're just like a father who is incestuous and want to stop his... He, he sleeps sleep with, with his daughter, daughter but he, he wants to stop his son from sleeping with his mother. mother. Now, now this, this is, is what white, white supremacy does. does. The, the whites in Mississippi don't, don't like the whites who are around killing Negro. Negro. But, but they've tolerated so long until, until the law they cannot, cannot bring, bring themselves, themselves to enforce it. And we've we got, got to stop this. Mr. Mr. Rowan. Mr. Carmichael, do I detect that you agree with Mr. Meredith that the Negro may have to take arms? I am here to answer Mr. Spivak directly. That, that is, in fact, the law. law. And, and let it remain, remain crystal clear, clear that in this country we are the only people who have to protect ourselves against our protection. protection. We, have we have to protect, protect ourselves, ourselves against state troopers, troopers against, against police, police in Mississippi, against Jim Clark, Clark against, against Bolver in California, against, against policemen Rizzo in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And we, we have, have to protect, protect ourselves against these, and, and we, we do not, not protect ourselves since the police forces of this country and the federal government and the law Officials are not, are not protecting, protecting us, and who's going to protect, protect us? And I, and I agree 150 percent. And black, black people have to move to the position where they, they organize themselves, and they are, are in fact, fact their protection for each other. And, and in fact, fact of that 180 million, million people, because I'm a little bit tired of that, that 90 percentage theory. theory. I want to talk about that just for a minute, if I may. While, While we may be 10 percent inside the country, continental borders of the United States, we want to make it crystal clear that we're, we're well located in cities, cities across, across this country. And that, and that if, in fact, 180 million people just think they're going to turn on us and we're going to sit there, there like, like the Nazis, Nazis did the Jews, they're wrong. wrong. We're, we're going to go down, down together, together, all of us. All of us. And, and the second, second thing is that, that we, we want this country to be crystal clear to understand, understand that if, if army is integrated and in Vietnam 40% of your fighting forces are black people, and if you think those black people are going to fight a war while 180 million people turn on its fellow black brothers inside this country and continue fighting a war, you're mistaken. And, and thirdly, while we may be 10% inside the continental borders of the United States, outside the 180 are 10%. Understand that. Mr. Carmichael, let me ask how many Negroes you think agree with what you just said. Well, it'll be left to be seen. Harris Polls tell me only 19 cents. I noticed that the Newsweek magazine said 19% of the rank and file Negroes approve of you as a leader. That 33% of what Newsweek called the Negro Leadership Group approved of you and your activities. Do you believe your following is really this low among Negroes? Well, I don't know. I was just... One thing, when, when I looked at that poll, they, they had several other Negro, Negro leaders pulled up above me, and I wonder why they weren't invited to meet me for press. And I wonder why, why the country is so obsessed with SNCs, and only 19% of the rank, rank and file are listening to a team that they don't even worry about my minority to get about it. Could it be that the press delights in misquoting you, Mr. Carmichael? It could be the press speaks from a white power base. Well, let me ask you this, since we're back to black power again. Uh, is, is it that your organization decided not to define it again because it concluded that it was a public relations blunder to toss out a phrase whose meaning was so obscure and whose emotional impact was so great that it divided Negroes, alienated whites, and confused everybody? On the contrary, 
the projection, projection of the term black power, power came, came from the white press, press never, never from, from black, black people, people in this, in this country. country. The, the, the debate, debate about that was raised among white, white people and, and the white press, press. And, and it's, in, in fact, fact, attempt, attempt to, to smear and, and to distort SNCC. And, and that is crystal clear in my mind that any white man in this country knows about power, he knows what white power is, and he ought to know what black power is. And for the newspapers which have analyzed the power structure of Vietnam and the power play in the Cold War, not to understand what black power is in this country, is certainly ludicrous. Mr. Kilpatrick. Kilpatrick. Mr. Young, Young let, let me pursue a somewhat, somewhat different theme for a moment. The Equal, equal Employment, Employment Opportunities Commission has now been in operation for a little bit more than a full year. year. Are you, Are you satisfied, satisfied or dissatisfied with the record you just set over this past year? I'm dissatisfied. I uh, feel, feel that the mission was so getting organized, organized that, that it initially was not aggressive enough, enough in uh, carrying out what its basic mission, mission was, and, and that was to implement the law. law. I, felt I felt that initially they were too much, much concerned concern about trying to get people to do something voluntarily that they were supposed to see that they did as a matter of law. I don't, I don't think, think the mission has been aggressive enough. enough. I, don't I don't think, think that it has uh, pushed, pushed enough the whole matter of training uh, as a responsibility to the industry. I think, I think that, that it has uh, been, been poorly organized, organized and at this point, point uh, this is in the need of a major reorganization. Do you, Do you have in mind such a reorganization as that contemplated in the bill passed by the House in April, April that, that would give to the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission in general, general the same powers the NLRB has to issue its own cease and desist orders. I think, I think that's great, great that strength in the commission work, work providing it had the right administrative leadership. Is, is the civil, civil rights lobby, lobby if you will give the phrase, 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 pushing, pushing that, that house bill? Oh, yes, yes, yes we're supporting, supporting this. Uh, uh, Mr. Wilkins, Wilkins which which act, who actually heads the civil rights lobby, lobby uh, might, might be able to speak to this more in detail. In the field of employment opportunities, the statement the often is made on the part, part of many employers that they're perfectly willing to hire more Negro workers, but that none, none apply, or that, that so few who are qualified apply. How do, How do you respond, respond to that defense on their part? I think, I think this is very feeble. feeble. Uh, we, we have, have in, in this country, country in the corporate, corporate circles, the most creative uh, minds, the most imaginative people. Anything, anything they, they really, really want, want to do, any, any type, type of work, work that they really want to employ or to train, train they, they can, can do, do it. it. I, I think what has been happening is, is that many, many have assumed their responsibility to be met once, once they, they open their doors. doors. I think, I think many, many have been looking for the exceptional Negro. Negro. They've, They've been expecting a Negro to be, be superior to a white, white person. When, when you had no opportunity to be, they've been, been looking for Lena Horns, for secretaries, and Ralph Bunches, bunches for accounting jobs. jobs. Uh, they, they have not been willing to say we will hire the whole range of Negroes, Negroes that we have, have the whole range, range of white people. people. They have not been willing to say and set aside the, the jobs they have, that they have mediocre, mediocre white, white people or dumb white, white people, and set, set those aside for the mediocre or the not, not to write Negroes. Negroes. I, don't I don't think an industry has yet, yet uh, gone, gone all out. out. It, it has certainly changed in its policies, its announcements. It certainly has opened its doors to more talented. But I think it can do much more and what has been done up to now. Only, only convinces, convinces me what more they could do if they, if they really tried, tried because there has not been a major disturbance in, in any of these areas where they've they given new opportunities to Negroes. Negro. Mr. Mr. Evans. Mr. Mr. Wilkins, I want to ask you, uh, without uh, trying, trying to join a fight between you and, you and Mr. Carmichael about his last statement, statement. Do, you do you think, think it serves the uh, Negro, Negro or the white, white man, his, his purpose, purpose in any way to threaten that 10% of the Negro population can, if it has to, Drag down this whole country. Well, I didn't interpret Mr. Carmichael's remarks. He said, said we're, we're going, going, we're going to go down, down together, together, all of us. Well, if, if certain, certain things, things don't, don't happen. I think Mr. Carmichael is, uh, is a. If he, if he weren't, weren't where he is, he, is, he ought, ought to be in Madison Avenue. Avenue. He's, uh, he's, he's a public relations man, man uh, par, par excellence. excellence. And uh, he, he, he you know, abounds in the provocative phrase. Of course. Uh, no, no one, one believes, believes that the white uh, and the, uh, the Negro, Negro minority, minority in this country is going to take up arms and, and try to rectify every uh, wrong that has been done to the Negro race, race if somebody, somebody doesn't, doesn't rectify it through the regular channels. channels. Mr. Mr. Wilkins, Wilkins? Yeah. Uh, uh, may, may I just ask Mr. Carmichael if you would agree with that? Nobody in this country believes that 
as, as Mr. Mr. Wilkins, Wilkins just stated. stated. No, I, I think what Mr. Wilkins is saying, is saying and, and you, you ought to be clear in your mind, mind Mr. Mr. Evans, since, since you are a newspaper reporter, that we, we have been forced by statements, statements in this country which, which remind us of the 90% and what they can do, and the 180 million and what they can do, as if they say to us, now if you don't, don't do as exactly as we want you to do, if you don't follow what we prescribe for you, then, then we have the power to wipe you out. out. And, and that threat is not going to stand in my mind as a black man. man. I'm, I'm going to move, move to get, get the things that, that I have to get, to get in this country to be able to function as an equal. Mr. Mr. Wilkins, go, go back. Don't, don't you think it's precise this kind, kind of an approach, approach to the civil, civil rights problem, correct, correct or incorrect, that, that has aroused so much basic concern, fear, perhaps hostility over the whole black power concept? Isn't this precisely what is worrying so many white people today? Well, I go back, back to... Without, Without a yes, yes or, or no on that, I'll go back to the statement uh, of Dr. Dr. King, King some, some moments, moments ago. In the difference, difference between, between southern, southern hatred and northern, northern hatred, he went on to say. say. And that, that he, he was simply arousing, uh, not, not arousing it, but, but exposing it. Uh, the thing that I think he omitted or gave too little, little emphasis to was, was the direct, direct job competition in the North, North whereas you didn't have that, that sort of competition, competition in the South. South. And, and the people in the North who feel that the Negro is competitor for the job, job uh, will be fiercer, more, more fierce, fierce in their, their reaction than those, those down South who only, only had to defend the psychological superiority. They already, already had the physical superiority. Could, Could I, I ask one, one more question, question to you, Mr. Wilkins? Mr. Mr. Carmichael, Carmichael has said, said in Chicago, Chicago recently that there is, there is a tendency, tendency for the middle class Negro, Negro who has, has achieved exit from the ghetto, ghetto who has, has managed, managed to get out, out of the ghetto, to forget, forget the plight of the Negro, Negro in the ghetto once, once he, he has been emancipated. Do you, Do you agree, agree with that? that? If so, so is, is this a, a an endemic or is this peculiar to the Negro? Is this true of the Jew? In this, in this country, country of the Italian... Italian. Well, first, well, first, first place, I don't, I don't agree, agree with it. In the second, second place, place I, I feel that it isn't uh, peculiar to the Negro at all. all. Uh, everyone, everyone is trying to better, better his condition, condition in, in life. life. Everyone's, Everyone's trying, trying to get, get ahead. And uh, if you, you can move away from a warehouse, warehouse or on a street, street that, that has no paving to a street with paving, and far from warehouses, you do it. That's if you're normal. Whether, whether you're an American, American or whether you're a Lebanese, Lebanese doesn't, doesn't make any difference. Any difference. And uh, there's, there's too, too much, much evidence that the Negro middle class in this country, while, while not, not having done, done all it should have done, has, has nevertheless financed and, and supported and spearheaded the civil rights fight in the days when, when there were no people arguing philosophically about whether we should go this way or that way or the other way. There was only one way to go, and that was to jam your, your head, head right, right into the wall and fight, fight the man right on the firing line. line. And, that's and that's what the Negro middle, middle class did. did. Now, now because they have two suits, suits and, and wear a white collar and can, can speak English, English reasonably well, well they, have they have to take, take a lot of vituperation from those who, who are still, still in bed and say they've been forgotten. They haven't been forgotten. They haven't been been forgotten. Uh, they've, they've been uh, pretty, pretty well taken care of. But the Negro middle class can do more than it has done. Mr. Valeriani, Mr. Mr. McKissick, McKissick, what do you, do you consider, consider to be the number, number one priority of the civil rights movement today? I think, I think that uh, we've, we've got, got two, two basic, basic priorities that are facing us as a nation, and I, and I think one, one is uh, racism, racism, and, and the second, second is peace. peace. I, think I think they both are interwoven within, within our pattern, pattern of thinking. thinking. Uh, uh, when, when we, we talk, talk about... Uh, uh, when we, we talk, talk about, about black power, power for instance, you, 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 everybody, everybody gets excited. excited. Two little bitty, bitty words in the English, English language. One, one black, black, everybody goes going to the sixth grade, grade knows, knows what black means. Power, everybody that's going to the sixth grade, grade knows, knows what that means. And I, and get, I get a letter from, from Professor, Professor Harvard that says, explain black, black power. power. <laughs> that, that means putting power in black people's hands. We don't have it and we want some. That's simply what that means. Now, 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 answer your, your two basic, basic questions, questions you talked talk about, about is, is that, that I think, I think that, that we really got to change some values in this, in this country. country. 
I, 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 I think, think the war is indicative of black, black men going over to Vietnam, Vietnam and dying, dying for something, something that they don't, don't have a right for here. here. Uh, uh, I, I think, think that, that uh, not, not only do we, we have, have war, war, we got racist, racist thought. thought. It's a racist, racist thought, thought to oppose, oppose black, black people having, having power, power, if, if I, I can, can put, put it like that. that. That's, That's a racist, racist thought. thought. Because, because what, what you were saying is, I'm opposed, opposed to black, black people having, having power. power. Well, well, then, then you, you, you join Asia. And as, as a lawyer, lawyer, when you join Asia, Asia you, you start, start preparing, preparing and I start preparing. Because, because the issue is to join. So, so uh, when we say changing one of the most important issues today, I think, I think you've got, got two. You've got, got peace, and, and, and you've got, got racism. Racist, racist stuff. stuff. You want to add that that stuff? It's It seems to me that that's very indicative in terms of foreign policy of this country and its racist attitude outside of the country. It's exploitation of other non-white countries and, and the way it draws, draws its their resources, resources and bring, bring it back here to be industrialized. And one, and one of the, of the reasons, reasons why I think that black people, people now across, across the country who become politically conscious of what's, what's being, being done in Africa and Asia, Asia and Latin America by this country are saying, are saying that they must join up with those emerging countries in the third world because they, they have in fact the common needs, needs. That, that they must stop this system that, that is exploited and oppressed them because, because of their color. Mr. Spivak. May I ask Mr. Carmichael a question first? A minute ago, ago or a short while, while ago, ago when I was questioning you, 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 you said you weren't sure that you were citizens of this country. Was that, is that correct? correct? Yeah, yeah, I, I meant that in the sense that there are many, many people question that right now. Well, well, I'm only questioning question you. Are you, are you a citizen of this country? Or? Oh, you, oh, you mean, mean in terms of, in in terms of actual, actual rights? rights. I mean, I mean, are you obviously not. not. Uh, my, my, dear dear brother, my dear black brother, Dr. King, King and he even marched in Chicago, Chicago without, without getting a rock thrown on his head. Well, I'm, well, I'm talking about, about you. you. Well, well, I mean, have you a right to vote here? Are you a citizen of the country? Or are you still a citizen of Trinidad? I'm a citizen of the United States. Well, that's the question. On that sense. In the, the papers, papers, papers it is in the Senate. That's right. You, yeah. 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 you, yeah. Just, you just, just don't identify, identify yourself with, with, this, with, with the United, United States, States as it is today, day, and therefore, and therefore you have virtually thrown your, your citizenship out the window. window. That, that, oh, on the contrary, it seems, it seems to me that what, what we're saying, saying is that we see that there, that there are some changes, changes that have, have to be brought, brought about in this country for people to live on the humanistic level that other people always talk about. And, and, and that it seems that that's what we say, that we're going to move to try and bring, bring about those changes. Since people, people in this country do not live on, on the humanistic level. Well, 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 uh, well, 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 the SNCC uh, uh, position, position paper, paper, which was recently published by the New York, New York Times, uh, quoted, quoted uh, SNCC as saying, uh, uh, these were the words, we're now aware that the NAACP is no reactionary, is controlled by the black power structure itself, and stands as one on the main roadblock to black freedom. Now, now, many, many of, of us have long believed that your organization is one of the oldest, has made one great, great contributions in getting, getting civil rights, rights laws uh, through, through the country, and in many, many, many other ways. Uh, what's, what's your answer to this rather, rather serious criticism made by, by the young, young more militant groups? groups? It's not, not for publication of the New York Times. Do you then repudiate that? No, no, I do not. I'm just saying it was not a public statement. Privately, we have a right to analyze other civil rights, rights groups, we never, never do it publicly. Well, well of course, course it's, uh, we, don't we don't agree with it, and we feel that it's a little uh, uninformed. Uh, we've, we've, this, this is nothing, nothing unusual in these times. times. There, there are thousands of young, young Negro, Negro people, people in this country, country who believe that the civil rights movement started in 1960 when, when they, they became, became active, active in it. And uh, so, so anything, anything uh, since 19, before 1960 has been aged and reactionary. Uh, this is, is not, not true. true. We, we feel that the NAACP is one of the most radical, radical organizations because it addresses itself. That is, is if you object, object it now. now. Mr. Mr. Spivak. Spivak. What, what is your what is your view? If the objective is to reform America so that the Negro can live here in equality, if you, if you can, can achieve his citizenship equality here, that's, that's the goal, goal, and that's, that's our goal in the NAACP, then uh, we, we have, have a radical, radical approach, not, not the reactionary approach, because we, we want that equality with all, all the weapons we can muster. Now, I'd, I'd like, like to add, both Nick and Cor seem to feel that integration is irrelevant in the civil rights, rights fight. fight. As, as far as, as I know, most of the uh, older and uh, 
Those, those who have called, called more responsible, responsible leaders have always felt that this, this is the fight, that this, this is the battle to integrate the Negro into American society. Have you, have you changed your position on that? Do you, you think, think it's irrelevant? The uh, SNCC uh, private, private paper, Mr. Carmichael, Carmichael says it was private, private paper, uses a very, very significant phrase. SNCC has, has become, become, it says, a closed society. We, we can't, can't agree, agree with this in any, any respect. No, no man is an island, island to, to quote, quote a familiar thing. thing. You, you can't, can't be a closed society and function, function in this world. Mr. Mr. Rowan. Mr. Young, yeah, we, we all know, know that the Negro and Civil, civil Rights movement, movement labors, labors under, under a great, great many burdens. burdens. Do, you Do you think it wise to add to it this extra burden of the Great, great debate, debate over Vietnam? Vietnam? No, no, I, I find, find myself have terribly distressed, distressed uh, by a great, great deal of this conversation today that instead of focusing on the basic gap the situation, situation where, where the Negro is 55% average, average family income, income that of the white, uh, two and, and a half times, three times, and then the Negro is unemployed, 40% of all Negro, Negro families live in substandard housing. As long, as long as we, we have, have this situation, we will, we will always have these problems that seem to upset people. people. And, and people, people get, get that when they, they were in the same, same situation, labor, labor movement, the women, women Irish, Irish groups, they, they demonstrated, they, they marched, marched in the streets, street, they, they fought, fought all these things. things. Now, as, as far as Vietnam, Vietnam is concerned, uh, the Arab League takes, takes no position on Vietnam. We, we know this, that, that we, we had a race problem, problem in this country before, before Vietnam, Vietnam will have, have a race problem after it's, it's gone. gone. We know, we know well, well that at the resistance, savage resistance we're running into in Chicago has nothing, nothing to do with Vietnam. We know that the unemployment uh, uh, certainly, the lack, lack of employment on the part of some industries is not, not related to Vietnam. Vietnam. We, we think, think as an individual, one, one has a right, right to take a position. Our, Our concern is that there be no money diverted into, into Vietnam that ought to go into the poverty program, and, and we also are concerned about the 60,000 Negro fellows who are in, in Vietnam, Vietnam whether we like it or not, and we, we want to see when they come back, back to these men uh, their, their rights, rights are respected, are respected because, because one man, man from Iraq, Iraq seems to upset, upset more people, people uh, and watch, watch than the hundreds, hundreds of Negro boys, boys who are dying in, in, in Vietnam. Excuse, Excuse me, gentlemen, we, we have, have just two minutes, two minutes more, Mr. Kilpatrick. One wanted to ask questions, question, Mr. McKissick, McKissick, if I could, relative to core and, and politics. In, in the book that he published back in February, James Farmer spoke quite candidly of a major change in core's policies that will, that will take, take you into more direct, direct political, political involvement. He called, he called it open political, political action, partisan and, and direct. direct. Can, Can you tell us how widely Core will be engaged, engaged this fall in congressional campaigns? Well, uh, we, we will... Uh, when, when, you, when, when we talk, talk about one in the politics, politics we, can we can talk on one level about parties, we can, we can talk, talk on another level about, about uh, personalities, and then we can talk on another level about issues. Well, Mr. Farmer, Farmer talked on every level. He, he talked about yes. even for running his own candidates for public office, office and, and supporting particular candidates and particular parties. parties. Uh, on, on that score, let me ask a question, question just, just for information. Are the contributions to the board tax deductible, uh, or are they not? Contributions are not tax deductible. So then you can involve yourself in politics. That's correct. Mr. Evan, you have a question? You and Ronnie Rayburn wrestled that so-called war crime trials in Europe. Are you going? going? Yes, we have student of our own calling committee has certainly accepted you personally the invitation. Invitation to what? Let's make it quick. To attend the war tribunal. tribunal is being, being convened, convened in, uh, by, by Mr. Russell and Bird Russell. Russell. Are you, are you going, going yourself, Mr. Carmichael? Michael? I'm, I'm not sure, sure but I'd like to. Do you, think, do you think that the Johnson is guilty? Is that fair? I didn't say I did. That's why I'm going to the war tribunal to see the evidence. You think it may be? Well, I, I certainly, certainly don't agree with the war in Vietnam. I think it is an immoral war. war. Yes, yes, I think, I think it, it is an immoral war. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, gentlemen, I must interrupt. Time, time, time is up. Thank, Thank you, all of you, for being with us today on, on this special edition of Meet Me Press. press. Next, Next Sunday, Sunday, we'll be back, back at our regular time, time on both television and radio, and our guest will be George Meany, president of the AFL-CIO. Check your local listings for the exact time in your area. Now, now this is Edmund Newman, Newman saying goodbye for Dr. Martin, Martin Luther King, King Roy, Roy Wilkins, Whitney Young, Whitney Young Floyd, Floyd McKissick, Stokely Carmichael, Carmichael James, James Meredith, our panel, our panel of reporters, and meet, meet the press. press.
For a for printed, printed copy of today's interview, send 10 cents in coin and, and a stamp, stamp self-addressed self-addressed envelope, envelope to, to Merkel, Merkel Press, Press, Box 2111, Washington, D.C., 20013. Join, Join us each Sunday, Sunday for News in the, news in the making, making as, as the nation's top, top reporters put challenging, challenging questions to world leaders, leaders on Meet the Press, Press America's, America's Press, Press Conference, Conference of the, of the Air. air. Close, Close by, by a mass of decency, organized, organized crime, crime continues to drain billions, billions of dollars annually from the, from the American economy. economy. Where, Where would it end? Thursday, Thursday evening, NBC explores the world of big business crime in an American, American white paper, paper organized crime, crime in the United, United States. States. Don't, Don't miss this three and one half hour special Thursday evening at 7.30, 6.30 Central Time here on the Full Color Network, NBC. This is Lee Dayton speaking. Meet, Meet the Press, press has, has been a public, public affairs, affairs presentation of NBC, NBC News and, and has come to you live from Washington, D.C.